This week on the chat live, after a a few weeks off because of various guests dro dropping out and me doing a conference, we have the amazing Tim Hughes, who is somebody who I said, you can have between this number and this number of books. He picks the maximum number of books. So it's going to be a good show. So how did you end up as such an avid reader of especially business books, Tim? Um I'm a CEO of a company and and I and I have to be as good as I can be. I have people that rely on me and, and I'm responsible for. And anything that I can do to to be the best possible person I can be. I, and so I'm 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 constantly I can't I can't get enough absorb enough information. I would like to absorb more, but anything that I can do to to be better and to be a good leader, um and so I don't understand that. I would have thought every, all leaders were like that. Yeah, well, you'd think so. but uh, You would think so. <laughs> that's not the way the, way the world, world works, unfortunately. Okay, do you want to, shall we leap straight into the first book? Because we've got a lot of yeah, books. Yeah, absolutely, here. yeah. Okay. So. And the first book is Creativity, Inc. by Edwin Catmull. Yes. Um, this is just, I mean, this is just an amazing book. I'm, I'm probably going to say that. Well, I'm going to say that about uh, all of them. The thing about this book is that you get, um, you're getting three books in one. So the first thing is that you're getting a book about Pixar, which I've, I mean, I've not actually really watched any of their films. But but the, the point is, is that it's a modern a modern company um you you learn also about um how they built the company the culture in that organization and they built a culture where you could question people because the the, the thing that was so important is the film had to be a success they were a startup it it had to sell yeah um and they built this 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 culture um, and there was many films where you, you go through and it said, well, actually, the film started off like this. And we realized that when we showed it to people, they didn't understand the story, like um, Finding Nemo or something like that. The one but the fish, the, 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 the yeah. um, film about the fish in the fish tank. And um, and, and that was it, it's that, that's what's really interesting. The second thing is that um, it's a book about mergers and acquisitions because they got bought out by Disney. Yeah. And it, and it was a classic case of you've got one culture here and one culture down here. How can we bring them together? Um, and the third thing, which is why it's a great book, is Steve Jobs was an investor in Pixar. And so St you get this story about Steve Jobs. So, if you, you know, as you see, I'm wearing a black, um, well, it's a blue jumper. <laughs> you're, you're doing your Steve Jobs. I'm, I'm Steve thing, Jobs but... disc in, yeah. in the way that I dress. So, so um, what you've got is this, this, this also this story of Steve Jobs, which is sometimes he was an arrogant, um, and sometimes he was absolutely amazing. But, but overall, he was supportive of the company. I think he made a billion dollars out of the sale or something. You know, mm -hmm. something that you would never be able to spend. Yeah. Okay. So, what would you say were your major lessons personally from reading this book? For your own business um for me the the lessons from this is have, have been about the culture mm -hmm. and the culture of um, i have a business partner adam gray and we've always said from the the day one is that we don't have all of the answers yeah. and I, and that's quite different from leadership whereas there is an expectation that a ceo or the senior management have the answers um and therefore we seem to have created a culture where people can 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 challenge us, because again, we're going back to the Pixar thing. We're a small business. We're challenging the status quo, and you know we're challenging billion billions of dollars of investment that goes into sales and marketing because we've got to found a better way of doing it. But to, to, to we have to be the best, and yeah. and getting input from everybody has is so important. Yeah, so you feel like it's helped you with having a non sort of confrontational culture or a creative culture, I would guess. Yes, yes, and that's about understanding the people and understanding different the, the different 
um, their, their different personalities. You know, the, the intro, I always tell the story about Rob, who's an introvert, who doesn't say yeah. anything. Um, and and it's a cl classic classic case of you get all the extroverts basically doing all the talking and they come up with a solution. And then Rob basically says, yeah, but if you did this, it would be far better. Yeah. And everyone gets really frustrated with him or did in, in previous employments because they say, well, why didn't you say anything? Because he's an introvert. He's not going to speak yeah, up. Push himself and up. so what you do is you, you now, and he knows I do this and he knows I talk about it on podcasts, is you allow the introverts to get so far down the process and then you go to Rob and say, Rob, what do you think? Yeah. And he okay. comes in with something, and all of a sudden you go, "I never thought of that." Mm -hmm. And also, and we're off in a different direction. And you just you keep using Rob to basically, and the solutions that we we get are far better than just allowing all the in, all the extroverts basically yeah. to jump away. Yeah. Okay. Should we go on to the next book? Yes. Yeah, give me a chance. I could play the book changes. You got you to play the thing. Sprint by Jake. Cap. Yes. So um, Sprint is a great book for anybody who is setting up a startup. Yeah. It's a methodology, um, which sounds really boring, but actually um, Jake makes it sound really, really fun. The, the mistake everybody makes in a startup is that, and if you read lots of startup articles, what you'll get is someone will say, what you need is a minimal viable product, yeah, an MVP. That's not what you need. What you need is to test your ideas. And Sprint is a, a way, I understand it's, a, it's an agile term yeah. as well, which is where um, you build something in, in effect five days. And it can be just a diagram. It could just be a a, a screen to go on a mobile phone or something like that but it's actually testing out the idea rather than going and you know going through all the cost and the expense of coming up with a minimal viable product that that at the end of the day nobody wants um a great great example of that is slack which is yeah. a tool that we use and is used throughout the world um if people don't know, what happened was that the, 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 the company that sets up Slack were originally wrote a, uh, a game. And you know there's a, you know that view that if only we wrote games that where everybody was nice to each other rather than shooting each other. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great? Anyway, they wrote that, that game. Anyway, nobody wanted it. But they didn't want a messaging system. Yeah. So they but they'd written this internal messaging system and yeah. they suddenly thought, why don't we take the internal messaging system mm. and sell that? And they did. Yeah. Yeah, I used to use uh, Agile methodology when I was in IT, mm. and it is fantastic when it works. Um, a lot of the time, people don't, as you say, a lot of the time, people just don't use it properly. So it sounds yeah, like this. Yes, yeah, so understanding Agile, it's it's a, a term for where you may be going along on the process and, and there's a backlog of um, bugs or something like that. So you do a sprint of two weeks or three weeks where you say right what we're going to do is we're going to clear yeah. the bugs in in that amount of time but from from a book perspective it's it's a great methodology for for um saying let's do something and let's just test it actually works five days yeah and that's how it's supposed to work in it as well actually you're supposed to be like produce something that people can interact with so they can tell you if it's right or not yes anyway should we go on to the next book yeah Crossing the Chasm by Jeff Moore. Crossing the Chasm, yeah. Mm, um, you, yeah, this 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 is actually an old book. Mm. Um, I think, I, yeah, it's it was first published in 1991, which makes it seem like a, a an old book. I've actually launched five products to the market that have all been successful just using the techniques that, which mm. are in that, and it's still. Um, the the concepts in it are still. It, it's I guess it's like a, a number of concepts that are, that are around. It's still um, uh, work worthwhile in the fact that you've got this. You've got a um, a product um, uh, 
trying to think of the it, you know you've got various people will accept certain products as you go through so you get early adopters and yeah. uh, there's the person that always get the gets the iphone when they comes out and then there'll be a person that will say well i'm not going to get the most um up-to-date one or whatever and but people will accept certain amounts of risk um but the the, the issue is how do you move um product people taking on products from early adopters to actually people that are not that are completely risk averse so how how is it that we can move and get those people that are, are not risk averse to actually buy the product and crossing the chasm is this is is a methodology that shows you how to actually move move or start doing certain things to get those people the mid, the middle majority um, who are not risk takers um, to actually accept a product it's it's um, I remember reading it. It was one of the first mark, one of the first marketing books. Yeah. We will talk about my first marketing book right at the end. <laughs> yeah. But um, th it was one of the first, and it was like one of those moments where you go, "Oh yes, of course, of course." Yeah. So it sounds like this has been one of the more pivotal books in your business career. Would you say that? Yes, uh, it, it's it's something that I've 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 always gone back to, and. Um, and use the, the the concepts. He he did write another book, which is called In the Tornado, which is about how to set up organisations when um, um, when there's such a um, uh, um, what, what it, the IT world. You you've worked in IT. When I yeah. used to work for a, a US software company, and you know, in effect, we. As, as as with most things in the early IT, you could just sell the stuff. You would open the window in the um, in the morning. The orders would come in, and then you'd shut the window because you needed to process the. You know, it was it was that sort of thing, and and it talks about how you set up a company when you're you're working in that environment. It 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 it, it was of an, of an age, but certainly the crossing the chasm is still relevant today. Well, I mean, if you consider all the hype about AI at the moment, those companies are probably going to have to be doing exactly the same sort of stuff. Well, okay, good, good example. Yeah, I mean, mm. you could be in a situation in an AI company where um, you're just, you know, you're you're actually in a situation where you what you're trying to do is actually qualify the people that are wasting your time that have contacted yeah. you and the, and the people that are actually contacting you that are actually going to buy. And, you know, I've been in situations like that. Yeah. Okay, so let's go on to the next book. Build by Tony Fidel. Yes, um, this is quite a newish book. Um, and uh, it's about the building of the products that Google ultimately bought mm. to become the, um, is it the Nest products? Oh, okay. Uh, the thermostats and, yeah. and stuff. So Tony talks about um, his uh, his work when he was at Apple. He worked in products in in, in Apple, um, and that gave him the um, the background to actually understand how to run a company. And there's stuff in there about culture. Um, but he, he he also found that when he was traveling, that he was always in a situation where he'd go in a um, hotel. And the room wasn't the right temperature. And you'd go to the wall and there'd be this box and it would <laughs> never work. You stayed yeah. in those, those hotels. And, and he just started becoming obsessed about thermostats um, and reckoned he could then build one, build one that was better. And they set up the, the company. And um, again, it goes through the process of creating a minimal vile product. Um, they then um, go through a process of saying, what as a business do they want to be and they wanted to be an honest company and they wanted to be you know if, if you rang up and said this doesn't work they said okay we'll give you money back um yeah. and then what happened was that they sold to google and that was interesting because google makes its money from ads and therefore, before they actually signed on the dotted line, what happened was that someone put a press release out, nothing to do with those two, that said, if you've got these Nest thermostats, you were going to get ads on, on it through Google. Yeah. And, and Tony said, that, no way. And so what happened? So Tony basically said, no way. And then the Google people basically said, well, uh, he's trying to kill the ad, ad 
business. So the moment that they basically signed on the deal, the Google people saw them as a competition and immediately tried to kill the company. Mm. And, and, and sort of turned on. So yeah. you've got this, again, you've got this great example of um, mergers and acquisitions and yeah. how there was a whole bunch of learnings that they could have done to actually make the marriage a little bit better rather than going through this process of um, um, the, 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 uh, the master turning on the servant. And there was all kinds of things that they went through in terms of as soon as they became a Google, Google company, all the Google overhead basically came, you know, there was, they, they all of a sudden fruit turned up and, and there was all day fruit and there's all day food and there was mm. as many pool tables as you wanted and comfy chairs and, and stuff, stuff like that. Uh, and, 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 and that was completely different because it actually, Tony had been running it as a very fugal organization. Yeah. It didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. So it was a lot about a cut change in cult, uh, mm. company culture as well. Then. Yes. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. The first ninety days. Yes. Uh, by Michael D. Watkins. Yes. If you are either get if you've got a promotion, uh, or move jobs within your organization, or you are um, you're starting a new job, you need this book. It, it tells you um, what you need to do in the first 90 days. We've all been in jobs where um, we've gone to see, organize, you know, we've gone into organizations or whatever. I don't know about you, but I've always done the thing where you sit and listen and, and try and yeah. find out what's going on. Um, uh, but also that, that which is that sometimes is the better than going in and actually trying to force your opinion on stuff. But um, whatever happens is that there's a whole bunch of spreadsheets. There's all kinds of things about setting objectives, about going out and talking to the different stakeholders. And it's, it's just a really good set of processes to take you through those first 90 days. And it's one of those books where you buy and then you need to read in the, the, um, the interview process because you're going to probably be presenting that if you need to present a 30, 60, 90 as part of the interview process. Or what you need to do is, and once you get in the job, you need to read it as well, because, but, but it's a, it provides you with a, a fantastic process. And as I said, it's, it's whether you're getting a promotion. It's not just about getting a new job. It's about making sure that you get a promotion um, and making sure that role works. Because again, we've all seen people being promoted from like, individual contributor to manager and then that not working oh yeah i think that's one of the biggest there's a lot of people who get promoted because they're good at the job they did but that doesn't mm. make them good managers so I, I've, I've seen it a lot in sales yeah. where uh, people are very good at sales but they but they don't necessarily have the um emotional intelligence to actually deal with the leadership role yeah, it's depressing, isn't it? In some ways, but that's why we need books. So it, it is, it is, and that um, the first ninety days by Michael D. Watkins is a, is a great book at providing you with that that step. Okay. Dare to lead by Brené Brown. Brené Brown. I mean, I could have bought all of her books along. She's been mentioned on this show before. If you, sure she has. I'm sure she yeah. has. And um, um, it's just a fun, it's the first book I read of hers. And then I went backwards yeah. um, and started reading all the ones before. It's, it's a fantastic book about real leadership today. Um, and if people haven't done, they shouldn't, they need to go and watch her two TED Talks. Um, they are serious, but they're also funny at the same time. Um, she um, talks about shame. She talks about vulnerability. Um you know, leadership is a lonely, lonely yeah. um, um, job. Um, I remember the first time I, I became, went into a leadership position and I've been running up until that point, I've been running meetings and then uh, attending meetings. And then usually what would happen is after the meeting, you'd all ring each other up on the way home in the car, hands free, of course. Um <laughs> And um, say, wasn't that a rubbish meeting? Why were we there? What was a waste of time? And then the first time I was leading, what happened was nobody called me. Yeah. Uh, and it was then that I realised that actually leadership is this lonely place. Uh, and, you know, 
she if if you if people aren't aware of her 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 um secret power is this is is this one of vulnerability and shame and the fact that we should understand vulnerability and lean into it and and it's going back to what i said right at the beginning which is that um as a leader you don't have all the answers yeah and and it's about making sure that you have a culture where people feel that they can share um and give you that and give you their ideas and they will be um supported with those ideas and you will give them the the credit for it as well okay i think i've seen one of her ted talks online probably not the other I, she's on my list. The trouble with this show is I have an enormous list of books to get through now. I bet, people, yeah. That people have recommended. Uh, and I try and read or listen to the audiobook of one from every show, but I'm still at about four behind. So uh, something like this might. But I don't know which one of your books I'll pick to read. I'll have to go, wait, wait until you go through the whole list and I'll make a decision at some point. It, it, it's also about having those tough conversations, and I'm going to come on to those as well. Yeah. About it's it, leadership is 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 not just about um, knowing how to take products to market or culture. It's about sometimes you have to fire people. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you have to have difficult conversations with them or whatever. Um, and and how do you go about doing that? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go on to the next. Lost and Founder by Ran Fishkin. And this has been on the show before this book, so I'm sure it has. I bought this for all the people on my board. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a Ran Fishkin used to um he used to do this, he, he used to be the founder of Moz. Mm. Um and, and and for people that may remember, he used to do these SEO whiteboard Fridays. They were just fantastic. Um and he the book the, the book is all about a startup, which was Moss, and how he went about it and the vision that he had for the 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 um the organization, not just the vision for the product, but the vision for the people and um and the way it should work. Um and um he talks about the venture capital world. And he talks a lot about that and the fact that they got venture capital funding. And of course, then he lost control of the business. Yeah, because what happens is that the the, the people, the venture team team have an uh, um, have a, an objective and an agenda, which is different from the founders. Um, and at one point, they had to lay people off, and he had a big row with them at the board meeting, and um, and, and left. It's if 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 you're out there and you're looking at a startup and you're thinking about. Um, taking venture capital money or um you already have taken venture capital money you got to read this book because yeah. it uh, you know um it gives you the 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 real the real objective of what vcs want um i mean they got a point where they they were offered money for the company good money but it wasn't enough for what the vcs wanted yeah. So in the end, what happened was that you know they they the, the company had reached a peak, they could have sold and all been very very happy, but it wasn't enough. And then what happened was that the company basically went like this, and then it just became another company on the scrap heap, because mm -hmm. you know, VCs have a policy of what you know out of every ten companies they fund, one or two will be a success. Yeah. And when you're emotionally connected to your your company like he was. It's a great story. Well, it's yeah. true. Yeah, I have a fairly dim view personally of venture capitalist companies, but then again, they, they do fill a need, but I think people think that they're going to win the jackpot by getting VC funding, and often they give away 70% of their company. And well, what's, then, what's happened is it's, it's changed the way the world of business. Yeah. So when if I'd started a company 100 years ago, I would have started the company and expected the company still to be running a hundred years later. Yeah. Now what we do is that we start up companies to sell. Yeah. So, so what happens is that we, we, we have, we, we, we work out in our heads what the window is in, in terms of what we're going to sell and then work to that. So, um, you know, I've got a blog that I'm writing at the moment, which is about how the way people are selling and marketing at the moment are deliberately playing to that to the point where what they're doing is that they that they they work in a way where they're killing their future business yeah 
Uh, and because what they're going to do is they're going to sell. The future business won't be anything to do with them. It will be the to whoever <laughs> they would have sold it to. Yeah, so it's going to be like the way that politicians are with their... But if we can keep it going for five years until they let the next lot sort out, work. yeah, 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 yes, it, yes, it, and then and then and then we'll hand it over, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, this I'm interested in this book, Be More Pirate by Sam Conniff. Yes, yeah, so actually, that's the back, Ooh. but that's the front, but that's the but be, be more pirate. <laughs> the titles on the back, but it's yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Uh, this, um, my uh, my business partner and I, Adam Gray. Uh, we had the opportunity to see Sam speak before um, the book was actually published. Um, and it, it, it was just an idea. It was kind of a bit of a Mickey take. Yeah. Um, and um, but what he does is that he put, he puts out it's, it's in effect a manifesto about why we should be more pirates or why we should be more um, why we should challenge things more um out in business yeah so um there's a number of things you may not know so for example um pirates had um they were the first people to have really to have medical insurance they were the first people to have same-sex marriages yeah. they were a diverse organization because they tend to pick people from all over the the world so they had a very diverse workforce so what he does is he draws this analogy about how um, pirates were, in effect, the, the companies of the future or the companies that we, we, we want to have in the future. Um, and we all stuck in these companies where there seemed to be processes that were kind of made at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon where they say, well, we do this and do this. And or now it's time to go home. And you go, so why do we do it this way? Oh, we've always done it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and so he, he talks about having a process of saying, just going into your organization and say, can we, could we really, could we have a, you know, work out a better way of doing this process? Um, and, um, and also, I mean, he's, he's created a movement from it. Um, but he's, he's one of these people that doesn't like fame. Yeah. So in a way, um, I don't know if, if, if you or your old audience are, are old enough to remember Reggie Perrin. But in a way, he became successful, but then kind of destroyed it. Yeah, um, I'm old enough to remember Reggie Perry. Right. Okay, right. So, so, um, um, but it's a great fun book. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, it's it, it's got it had to be on the list. Yeah, and you're going to change your hand for a hook, so you know. You, yeah, 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 ah, ah, yeah, ah, ah, me heart is. <laughs> I'm just going to say ah a lot. Ah, ah, oh, ah, ah, the next book. Yeah, but their first love be the sea. Ah, <laughs> yeah, are you. Ah, the sea. Ah, Long John Silver. Yeah, I should have had a parrot on my. Yeah, well, that's uh, should be uh, be more power. Anyway, let's be more next week. Uh, which is using behavioural science uh, in marketing by Nancy Hart. 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 Yeah. Um, I've read a lot of marketing books. And I've read a lot of marketing books that say they're a different marketing book from all the others, and yeah. then not. Um, the thing I liked about this is that it doesn't pretend to be a different marketing book or whatever. But what it does is that Nancy used to work in advertising, um, and it and it takes you through all of the different ways that marketing use psychology, because that's the behavioral science, to get you to do certain things. Yeah. Um, you know, a bit like um, um, buy one, get one free or something's five ninety nine, So you, you don't think it's six pounds, but all of the different things. And and she, what she does is that there's little case studies and um, and, and they're all all written in a way that they're they're stories. Um, so, for example, she she talks at one night she was in um, in Spain. And um, she'd got this, she's speaking at a conference and she'd got this, um, someone had recommended her, you need to go to this restaurant. It does fantastic tapas, real proper tapas. Not that. And anyway, she, uh, she went out the door, the concierge said to her, um, where are you going to eat? And she said, oh, I'm going to this particular restaurant. And he said, okay. He said, 
it, that is a really good restaurant, but there is also this restaurant as well. And she said, okay, man, like, whatever. It's just, you know, obviously this concierge is on a backhander and I go in there and say, yeah, the concierge sent me and, and he gets a 10 euros or something. Um, anyway, she went down to the restaurant. So actually they were next to each other. And the one that the concierge basically recommended had a big queue outside it. And the one that she recommended had nobody in there. So which one did she go for? The one with the big queue outside. Yeah. Because obviously it was better. Yeah, well, that's what people think, isn't it? Even yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and so she goes in there and she said it was a fantastic yeah. meal. Then when she came out, there was a big queue outside the one that she had really the, originally wanted to go in. So she actually went in there and had a, um, a, a suite. Yeah. And said it was fantastic. But what she's, it, it's, it's these stories that she tells that also brings, uh, brings the book alive in terms of saying, here's a, here's a, here's a psychological thing that marketers are doing. Um, and this is, this is a good example of that in the real world. And it's a, it's a lovely book. Um, and she's a lovely person as well. Okay. Well, that always helps actually. It does, yes. <laughs> know the person. Okay, let's go on to the next one. And Unreceptive by Tom Stanfield. Yes. Um, I read a lot of sales books as well. Yeah. And a lot of the sales books are very, very similar as well. Yeah. Um, but this one is different because Tom actually recognises that the modern buyer today is just tired of all of the cold calling and all of the spam and, and everything. Yeah. Um, and we have mechanisms to stop all that. So, for example, in Europe, we have GDPR. Um, and in the States, they're getting very GDPR type legislation. Um, we have facilities like on our iPhones so that if someone calls, and they're not the numbers not in your address book. You know it's a cold corner. You can just put it to voicemail. Yeah. Um, so there's all kinds of things, gatekeepers. Um, and what he does is he writes a book about we know that the buyer is unresponsive. How is it that we can actually get hold of that person and ultimately have a conversation? Because what we sell is brilliant, of course. How can we have this conversation that's going to that will ultimately uh, lead them to that we can help them and they're going to buy something. Um, and, um, and and it's a great book to actually explain that, um, that process. Okay. I've actually got a comment, though. It's, it's, it's nice to me rather than you saying, love your book chats. Thank you from Cookbook Divas on the Amazon Live. So um, clearly you're, I think actually all of your book choices so far have been exceptional, I have to say. So... Uh, I'm, I'm flattering you as well. <laughs> right, on to the next one. Uh, Rehumanising the workplace. By... I was going to say Enid Blyton, or, um, the famous five. No. <laughs> well, Re I mean, it, it could have been rewritten. You never know. Rehumanising the workplace. Yeah. Right. Um, Chuck has written this book. And it's a process about how to run an organization yeah. and how to motivate people and get people involved and empowered. It's not about giving people objectives. It's not about giving, um, running it in a way that we're, we're used to it. It's, it's a completely different methodology. Now, this isn't about sitting around a campfire and singing Kumbaya or anything like that. Or you know, giving people lots of um, fruit and um, um, pool tables. It's a way you, that you can still measure people and see that they are contributing. But what, when they contribute, they're doing it in a way that they want to. Um, and it's certainly the the the, um, the the methodology the methodology that we're using internally to um, um, as as a startup ourselves to because. When, when when we were like a couple of people, I could decide whatever I wanted to do and say, right, well, this is the culture and this is what we're using internally. And if you are in a startup or thinking of doing that, it's a great book to do, to, to, to look at that. Yeah. I corrected the typo. I made it, I made it not zing, but zing at the end of it. So now it's humanising the, there we go. Right. 
on to the next one. I did that just in case you needed to cut and paste the... Um... No, well, I can actually sort it out in post-production for YouTube if I can be bothered. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's like... I do like to fix it, things like that. Uh, Beyond Good by Fyodora Lau. Yes. Um... I think there's also somebody else I've missed out. Yeah, there is, yes. Uh, Bradley uh, uh, Lima or Lima. Yeah. Um, anyway... Um, in, in the past, 100 years ago, there were a number of companies that when they set up, they created an environment that was there for the employees. So not very far from me, um, while it's now a gym, um, it used to be part of a company and it used to be there was a gym and there's a hockey court and there's a rugby field and there's a football field. And there's a couple of those places around me here in West London. And the, why, the reason why the company was set up was not to make profit, though there was some of that, was to actually provide um, support for people within society. Because, um, you know, your employee isn't just someone in the person that turns up, but you're paying, when you pay that person, you're paying for the food to go on the table of the family so so in effect you're 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 having an impact and in effect you could be having an impact to um a far wider you know grandparents or um yeah. you know i've got elderly parents um or children or, or grandchildren so you have a far wider societal view what they talk about in this book is bringing that back and rather than having governments being being tasked with actually um, looking after society, which they're notoriously bad at, yeah. um, is about actually making companies or not making companies, but actually companies wanting to support their employees. And if you think about um, the, the problems that we've had with both recruiting and retaining staff, when you talk to probably talk to anybody under the age of 30 you know my partner has a 27 year old you know he wants a company that he can believe in that that has a, an esg policy that is is doing things for society you know he he would want the company to i don't know make help the homeless in 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 the area yeah. and her book for me doesn't go far enough and and pardon me if i'm on a bit of a on a on a um, soapbox but this is about how business can actually help society and help people and 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 bring goodness into the world rather than being fat cats and 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 profit this and profit that and you know, so how can we actually use commerce as a way to make the world a better place okay well, so, yeah. Interesting. and she comes from a financial services background so it um an f so, so you know, she's saying that that banks have a um, have a responsibility not just to keep profit, but to support society. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting take, isn't it? Okay, let's on to the next one. Uh, Thinking in bets by Annie Duke. Yes, um, there's a um, this is a great book. Um, Annie is a uh, world-beating poker player, yeah. and um, uh, she talks about how uh, she started off playing poker, and now that she does presentations for businesses, and she talks about she draws an analogy with poker, which is first and foremost she actually plays very few hands because you only need to, you should only play a, a hand where you think you're going to win. Yeah. The other thing that she talks about is that there are the bad quite often what happens is that we make a decision based on the information that we have and there's a bad outcome and we go that was a bad decision and she said that's not the case she mm. said if you take make a decision as you've got a, a a hand of cards and you are um you make a decision based on the information that you have and it turns out wrong it was still a good decision yeah good decisions can have bad outcomes the same as bad decisions can have good outcomes. Yeah. 
uh, and 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 that's that for me is one of the, the the learning. There is a another book which is kind of paired to that, which is about forecasting and super forecasting. And there's a whole. Um, if you go out onto the internet, you'll find that there's these people that are taking bits of data and forecasting things. Um, and 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 it's but thinking in bets is a, just a great book about using decision making and and not being so restricted in the way that you think or, or or you're forming those decisions yeah i think the trouble with the internet a lot of the time is that a lot of the people who make bad decisions and get good outcomes are the people who tell everybody about that's what you should be doing <laughs> it's supposed to be cynical um anyway let's go into the next book before i get internet trolls and uh, the Wentworth Prospect by John Smibert. 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 Yeah, I've mispronounced. I think I mispronounced that deliberately. Actually, but yes, Smibert. Yes. Yeah, so I've again, yeah. I've read a lot of sales books. Yeah. Um, John, John contacted me. Um, I met him when he's he's Australian. I met him when I was in Australia on business, and he contacted me and he said, "I've written a book." He said, "It's a sales book." So yeah, and he said, "It's a novel." Mm -hmm. I said, "What?" He said, it's a novel. I said, so how does it, how does it work? He said, so he's, I actually got a copy of this. Um, um, this is, this one's signed. Right? Ooh, quite and, signed. Uh, yeah, and, and, um, so I actually, yeah. I actually read his first draft yeah. and, and it, 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 for me, I've, uh, all these sales books kind of sound the same, but this explains how to sell a, large value b2b business to business enterprise deal but as a novel yeah so you have characters you have things that go wrong you have um uh, a customer that you're trying to sell to you're trying to sell something that there's no way that you're going to sell and but but he actually brings it alive and his two co-authors uh maloney and um Cullo, that they they were the two people that so John basically came up with the original idea and then those two crafted it into the into a novel but it's a great fun um, thing and and it's Australian so you'll actually learn some um, Australian slang in there as oh, well okay. based in Sydney and they use um, Aust I actually said to him on the first draft I said you need to decide whether you're going to go all in on Australian slang or take it out and he decided to go all in on it. Okay, well that's good. Uh, probably doesn't help for sales, but uh, no. But it, it, in a way, it it kind of pr provides some context in terms of the because you've got these two salespeople, they're female as well, yeah. um, uh, 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 talking to each other in the office, but they're using um, as they would the Australian slang that you would use in the office. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Right. Lend Me Your Ears by Professor Max Atkinson. Yes, yeah, so this is probably, um, this is, this is, this is, oh, two, 2004. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's getting a bit old, but Professor Ma Max Atkinson was the person that, that changed um, the way that people present. So what you have in here, it's, it's, it is about storytelling, but actually it's about how to use emotion and emotive words. Um, it's, you're, gonna not, you're not going to like this bit. Okay, so you might want to cover your ears at this point, Tim. Um, it's been used a lot by politicians here in the UK. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, when, so when Tony Blair stood up and said, what we need is education, 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 that's one of the techniques that um, Max Atkinson talks about in his book about saying, take t about you decide what you're going to, what's the, what's the emphasis of this speech? Well, actually it's down to, we can hold three things in our head at only mm. one time. So, so um, the speech is an hour, but actually what we're going to do is what you're going to remember is the education, education, education. Yeah, um, and it's about using those techniques in a, a business environment to um, uh, on top of what you might do, you you might use in terms of telling stories. Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of people in business, probably me included, can learn. It's 
having those takeaways really that people actually remember it's it about them. yeah it's about um there was um brent adamson who wrote the challenger book which didn't make the cut actually because i gave my copy to somebody um <laughs> and um uh uh, he does a series on LinkedIn where he's about every week. And one of the things he was doing was he's talking recently about how when you give your presentation about how this isn't just about a slide and what you're going to say on the slide. It's about how are the people that the audience going to feel? You may want to make them feel uncomfortable. You may want them to feel comfortable. But but it's important that you think about that, not just about what you're going to say. Therefore, what you're going to say may you may change the you may need a thesaurus to look up some words to to change the emotion of of how you present. Yeah. Okay. Nearly through it. Nearly yeah. Right. Non-violent communication. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm changing uh, changing gear a bit in terms of the uh, the books in, for for leadership and what I would recommend. Yeah. Um, Nonviolent Communication is just a great book about how to um, talk to people empathetically. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're always in a situation where we often say things and we think that we could probably say things better. Um, and quite often we have a, 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 a wrong choice of words. And so what happens in the book is that you get these pages where um it talks about using certain certain words and there's also certain exercises about expressing feelings and things like that where i think we could always be better yeah. as leaders in talking to people this is this is a you know pages of um uh words that we 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 may want to use or may not want to use um and I, and i think what it does is it increases our vocabulary and it increases the 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 need or the, the the want of us to to actually be the best people we can. We're never always going to say the right thing all the right all the time, but you know, having something like this is a great resource that we can and um, look at to help us. Yeah, I was reading this originally and thinking, like, is he saying that we should not be violent to our staff? That kind of is a given, but I think it means non-violent in terms of non-aggressive, really, more than yes, yes. Non-violent. And there's a um, and there's another book uh, by Susan Scott called Fierce Conversations, yeah, um, which is another great book, um, which I haven't put in this. Which again is about you know we have to have um, difficult conversations with people, yeah, um, and um, and how can we do it the, the best way? Um, so sometimes, you know, we've, all, we, we, we've just got to be the best people we can. Yeah, no, I think that's a theme most books, actually. Uh, well, it should be a theme most books. Right. Atomic Habits, my... Uh, oh, James, Good. it's not... <laughs> I've not put them in the right order in my own thing, but Atomic Habits, yeah. So Tommy this Kevin, has been, yeah. it's been on the show before, but uh, I'm sure it has. Um, yeah. This is uh, I, I wanted to put some books in in terms of about mindset, about mental health um, and how we can look at ourselves and be the best people that we can be. You know, this is all about how, how to use habits to make yourself more efficient, because in some cases, yeah. habits are good um, and how to start habits how to cultivate habits or how to stop habits um you know um was it two and a half years ago when we we're in covid lockdown i suddenly decided i thought Do you know i need to be as fit as i can be if i'm going to catch this covid stuff um and therefore i'm going to start running mm -hmm. um and um and so how do you suddenly go from zero to starting running um, and um, how do you build that into a habit? And here I am two and a half years later, and I'm still doing it. You've still got to get up in the morning and go, do you know, it's yeah. raining outside, I don't fancy yeah. it. Um, but it's 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 how is it that you you make sure that you, you, you build it? Or I don't smoke, but, you know, stopping smoking or something like that, where, um, uh, how you know, what what's the best way of doing it and what's the the scientific way of doing it? And that's that's what that's about. Yeah, it's, it's funny, I've read that, well, I've listened to the audio book of that book, but I need to redo it because 
I can remember, oh, it was a very good book. I can't remember enough about what he actually said to do. It's it's one of those books where you probably want to go back and reread it, you know. I know, yeah. It's a, definitely a come back to you book. I mean. Anyway. Energize by Energize. Oh, the subtitle is Make the Most of Money or something like that. Energize, Make the Most Every Moment by Simon Alexander Ong. Yes. Um, it's 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 kind of a bookend to the atomic habits, yeah. which is this is about habits, uh, and this is about energy, yeah, and this is about how you can how you can live your life based on on your energy rather than thinking of time. And Simon's been tells talks about his journey. Um, you know, he was in a job in financial services where. He was having, you know, the, there was a drinking culture, and um, yeah. he said that he, he he remembers kind of being in bed, it, it's it, lying in a bath in his bath with his suit on, <laughs> and his girlfriend saying, "You can't carry on like this." Yeah, uh, and it was one of those wake up moments where he realised that um, he couldn't carry on like that, um, and he went through a, a a process of discovery, which he shares. Um, and it's it's very very easy to read, and it's a very very um, uh, walking through with you the things that you need to think about about how to live a better life, um, and and you know the fundamentals of a better life is to eat properly, to exercise, and to get some sleep, yeah. um, and then start building up from there. And 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 he, it's it's a great book. Yeah. Well, I certainly could do. I'm flagging on this Tuesday evening, so I could do with a bit of energy at the moment. But uh, maybe that maybe that's a book I should read from your collection. Right. Mindset by Carol Dweck. Is it Dweck. Dweck? Yeah. Carol Dweck. Yeah. This has been on the show before as well. I'm sure it has. I bought this for all my um, people on yeah. my board as well. Um, it's a classic uh, book about uh, fixed mindset and open mindset. Um, and um, it's, it makes you think. Um, and um, so um, the CEO of Microsoft, I think he, I think he bought the book for, for everybody, but um, he, he, when he took the company over, he knew he needed to change the culture and yeah. he needed to change the culture to a learning culture so the organization learns. Um, and part of that is having people that are willing to, to learn themselves. Um, and I, I'm a great believer that every day is a school day. Um, and uh, before we started, you say, so how did you, how, you know, how, how did we, do you, how do you, why do you read so many books? And I just, mm. because, because it's about, it's about learning and about yeah. learning different skills and, and and making myself a better person and part of that is having an open mindset i think we can be some of us can, we can still have fixed mindsets around certain things but having an open mindset in business understanding that you can be wrong um, yeah. and understanding that um that also that people are different yeah yeah i mean it's it's interesting with Microsoft because I don't think people have appreciated how much Microsoft changed after Bill Gates uh, left and the, the new CEO came in. They've like embraced open source software and things like that. Well, I think generally for the better. Um, oh, it, it's 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 massive. If you think about um, uh, Steve Ballmer and um, and and that period, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah. it got to a point where. Microsoft became a joke. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden they, they, you know, they, they embrace cloud. Yeah. And now they, they are, you know, they're one of the, the um, top four or five companies that provide cloud solutions in the world. Um, yeah. And that was a massive change for them. Yeah. And they are the people, I think they are the people who run uh, Chat GPT's cloud infrastructure. Which well, yeah, they they money. they immediately went in and and bought yeah. it. You know, the same as that they bought LinkedIn, um, yeah. so, which is you know which, they've made some some great acquisitions. Yeah. Anyway, let's go on to the next book before we uh, get acquired. 
Her Mission Marketing by Seth Godin. Seth Godin's no stranger to this show, though I don't think this particular book's been on before. Um, yeah, it's it's. I think it's 22 years old now. It's probably yeah. the first marketing book that I, I read. And it, it's made a massive impact on me because it's, it, even though it's 22 years, where, where, even though it's 22 years old, 1999. Yeah. Um, in it is all of the things that we think still today, which we don't like being attacked by salespeople or marketing people. Mm -hmm. We don't like being spammed. What we want is, in effect, to build a relationship with a, a, a brand or an organization um, and, and, and actually engage with them. You know, we do follow brands. We do follow companies. We may buy the same pair of jeans or the, you know, you might buy Nike trainers or you buy, always buy a Ford car or something. So there are, we, are, we, we, we do like brands, but we don't, we want to do it in our own way, which is what the permission is about. Um, and it's something that's always, you know, I remember reading it on the train. I lived in Coventry at the time and I remember reading it on the train and just sitting there sometimes looking out the window saying, this is, this is groundbreaking. Um, and I forgive Seth for not write, wanting to write a forward in my book. Third book. <laughs> did you ask him then? I did, yes. And he said he was too busy. And I can understand that. Oh, you should have just said, well, I'll get a chat GBT to create something. And you just put, say, right in the style of Seth Godin, and then uh, it'll be your way. Uh, so I presume this was the most influential marketing book you were talking about. Uh, it, it is, yeah. It's the first one, first proper marketing book that I remember reading and it's probably been the most um, influential book on me yeah. okay All right. to sell is human by Daniel Pink yes uh, I, I, I resisted reading this mm -hmm. um, and and then someone who who um, I Someone's opinion I really appreciate and uh, said you need to read it and, and I've done and it is it's it's for anybody who says I'm not a salesman. Yeah. Or who sits in an organization as an entrepreneur and say, I don't know how to sell, what do I do? It's not about selling methodology, it's not about how you can go and suddenly sell things. It's about the fact that actually it is something that we can do. And it's about yeah. it's more about giving you confidence to to enable you to to sell stuff especially if you're having to do it because you're a leader or you're an entrepreneur or something like that it's a soft yeah. it's a very very soft book in terms of of that and i would recommend it to for all entrepreneurs or people trying to start a business to read yeah well i mean i've always said that certainly with marketing as well but particularly with sales the best sales people are the people you don't really notice them selling if you yes. know somebody trying to sell to you, they're not doing it properly. Right? They're not doing it very well. Um, the best salespeople, you've already signed a bought the thing. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, I'm sold to. Um, that, that's the way it works. And the same with marketing. And it's like, if you notice people trying to market to you, they're not doing it very well. Um, yeah, yeah. And, that, and, I, and I think that um, we often talk to people about, um, you know, in sales, it's, you, you need to, you know, always be closing. And I, and I think that, you know, that that that's long gone because we now know how to buy. And what we need to be doing is that we need to be empowering people to, to buy. Now, what you'll get is that there's a number of people in America that think that selling is all about red meat and, mm. and testosterone and, um, um, you know, it's, Golden Gecko, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, and it's, it's there's this there's this male thing about it. Um, uh, and um, right, okay, that's 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 interesting. But actually, this is about helping people um, mm -hmm. and helping people realizing that 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 something that you can you, that you've got is going to help them. But it's about empowering them rather than actually closing them. Okay, well, I've got one more book to do. one more book, and it's by this. Tim Hughes person, social selling techniques to influence buyer, buyers and change makers by Timothy Hughes or Tim Hughes. So yeah. this is your book. It, it's my third book. book, yes. 
Oh, your third book. You could have had the other two on if you wanted to. But I think we well, I did. I, 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 well, um, that's my second book, and and, <laughs> and my my oh, oh, and my first book is basically the first version of the social selling one. Yeah. Um, there, there is a, a an Arabic version of that, Ooh. and a Chinese version of that, and mm. a, um, an Estonian version of that. Oh. And um, and there is a, a Vietnamese version of this marketing book, but yeah. um, so 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 marketing is about merging sales and and, and marketing. Didn't want to talk about that. Yeah. Um, good, there it is. I want to talk about my about my my current book, which is the social selling techniques yeah. of buyers and change makers. Um, the the book I've pretty much rewrote it from the the first edition. I took two weeks off. And went to Portugal with my partner and basically sit that sat there and 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 updated it because the original one was written in 2015, it came out in 2016, and so much has changed. Yeah. Okay. Also, what what ha has happened as well is that when I wrote the first version, it was very much uh, I'd had no practical experience. It was kind of I'd been working at a software company where we rolled out social selling across four thousand people, but it was fairly rudimentary. It was mainly about yeah. getting people up on LinkedIn. Um, doing some bits on Twitter and that, but having set up the um, uh, my company in in 2016 as well, there's 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 six years of of customers where we've where we've made so many learnings, and what I wanted to do was actually pour that into the book. So so first and foremost, it's a book about how business has changed through digital. Yeah. Um, and. Um, it's interesting that I've never made any of the business book awards because they that people read the title of social selling and they go, oh, it's not really about business, it's sales. But mm. actually, I explain about how business has changed from a digital point of view. Also, what I've done is I've got con contributions from companies such as Cyberhawk, um, uh, Telstra, Ring Central, Namos, which is a, um, an Oracle consultancy, Mercer, Ericsson, and I've got a headhunter as well to contribute because what i wanted to do was go out to the people that are doing this already practitioners and get their advice which is about saying tim hughes that this is the version of the world that, that, that tim hughes sees but this is also the version of the world that actually the ericsson's and the mercers and those see as well and, and bring that together um the first book's got 187 pages this sec this second version has got 306 so it's quite a big addition okay. in terms of yeah. the, the changes and and I, I am biased about this, but I am very proud of this book. Um, and it's the book that um, I want to be measured against rather than necessarily the previous ones, which I why I didn't pick the others. I wanted to just talk about this social sound book. Yeah. So who is your book aimed at? And can you give us any tidbits about what, without spoiling the book for anybody who wants to buy it, any tips? From the butler did it. No, um, <laughs> yes, uh, Colonel um, Mustard with the um LinkedIn sign in the um, yes, with the, with the tubing in the conservatory, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so, um, the, it's 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 aimed at anybody within sales and marketing, yeah. Um, and I've had um, you know, both both sales, salespeople and marketers, it's also aimed at people that are leading businesses as well because we talk about. Uh, that social media has changed the world. It's changed the world of business. It's, it's changed society. Yeah. And and you know we you know going back what five years we wouldn't have been doing this live yeah. streaming across Amazon. It would have been unheard of. We would have laughed. Mm. Um, and it's completely changed the way that we we uh, see the world. Um, and so I actually I talk about how in the book at the beginning we talk about how the classic way of getting hold of customers advertising cold calling and email email marketing the the ability to get hold of them is getting less and less and less and less and less and less and one of the reasons for that is partly accelerated by covid-19 which is the the fact that what's happened is that we've we've transferred from the physical world or the analog world to the digital world yeah so so it, so what happens is that here we are talking to the whole wide world um, you know, one minute we're we're feeding the dog and the next minute we go on to LinkedIn and we're actually in the digital world. And we're able to contact any of the 900 million people on LinkedIn and ultimately have a conversation with them. 
Um, and that's what one of the things we talk about is the fact that people think that social media is about posting content. It's not. No. Uh, yeah. uh, social media is about having conversations. People come to social media for conversations, not to read brochures. And what happens is that conversations create sales. So, so we have a um, um, we have a definition of social selling, which is it's using your presence and behavior on social media to build influence, make connections, grow relationships and trust, which lead to conversation and commercial interaction. Yeah. So we're not anti phone. So we're not saying that everything has to take place on social. What happens is that we use social media as a mechanism to have a conversation that ultimately will take us to um uh, take us maybe to a Zoom call or a Teams call or something like that. Um, but using social media as the mechanism to go to people, going back to Seth Godin, having mm. them ultimately to give us the permission to say, Do you know, we seem to have a number of things in common. Why don't we get on a call? Yeah. Uh, and, and I feel that with this book, in a way, I'm standing on the shoulders of Seth Godin you know, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, yeah. it's it's that book. It's 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 permission marketing that I read 21 years ago that gave me the inspiration um, to write this book and, and still gives me the inf in, the inspiration to 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 carry on, do what I'm doing. OK, so. I'm going to ask you a uh, hard question now. If you had to pick one of these books to give to somebody, apart from your own, so not <laughs> not social selling, which book would you give it? Or if and if you uh, if you have a logic tree for how you would do it, how you would work out which book to give to somebody, then tell us that. So it doesn't have to be well. I pick this book. You can say if it's the person is this person, then do this one and do this one. So. So I I I. I kind of built them into different sections. I mean, yeah. for, for me, um, it, if I had to go to somebody and say, you're a leader in an organization and you need to read one of these books, it would be the Rand Fishkin book. Yeah. I, I felt enough for, for me to buy that for all of my people on my board. Um, yeah. And um, I just think that there's so much in there in terms of, why he built the, the company, why he stood for what he stood for. Um, because sometimes being a leader, you actually, it's not a popularity contest. And sometimes yeah. leadership is about being unpopular. Yeah. Um, and for me, that that was the book that I think I sat down and went, yeah, okay, I, I, really, I really understand that I have a vision. We have a very clear vision of where we want to go. And that certain things could sour that vision. Yeah. And um, have you got any further books planned to write after um, social selling? Are you going to update any of your other books? Or I, do you, I don't do you know. I haven't had a conversation yet with Kogan Page. We're yeah. busily trying to sell this one. Yeah. Um, and so the first social selling book was selling... I mean, one of the reasons why we did the second edition was that the, the first book started selling as if it was a, a it would just come out. And during, COVID, yeah. as you can imagine, everyone sitting at home going, my God, what am I going to, how, how am I going to sell? Um, so we thought we'd update it. I, I haven't spoken to them yet. Do I want to write another one? Yes, I do. Yeah. And I don't know what it's about. I've, I find um, I've now got a really good rhythm about how to, how to, 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 to write books. Um, I get a lot, lot from it. You don't, you don't make any money, yeah. um, but I get a lot from it in terms of it's, the, the, it's the world's best business card. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to end the Amazon Live portion of this broadcast now. Thank you. And uh, you've been a great guest. And thanks, uh, thanks for the people who've been watching. So it's going to end this. Right. Now let's go on to the exciting YouTube bit where we can talk about things like, so talk to us a bit about your, your business and what kind of things you do, because it sounds like you've had a lot of experience with startups and selling in general, but for people who don't really know anything about Tim Hughes, 
what do you do? And uh, you can you can meet the expense if you like. This is going to go on YouTube and some recording. So if you're saying anything too bad, I can edit it out. So so, so my background is in sales. I'm yeah. I'm been in sales and I've been in leadership. Um, you know, I've got 25 years sales experience, and it's all around business to business enterprise. So my background yeah. is having accounting systems, um, and um, that's been mainly around. Um, either working for Oracle or working for partners. So I ran an Oracle partner, um, worked for a couple, and then went back to Oracle again. Um, so, you know, I, I've worked in corporate and big companies. I've also been running this startup now for the last, this is our seventh year. Um, and that's been interesting as well, because the first, the, the, the two um, competitors that we had when we first started off have basically fallen by the wayside. Um, and the way that we've done that is by innovating. Yeah. Uh, I know. What does the, is it DLA Ignite? The DLA Ignite, yes. And what 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 do you ignite? What, what is the product of uh, DLA Ignite? So when we, when we started off, um, Adam Gray, my business partner, and I, we had a very clear vision. Yeah. Um, we, we basically were offered a, um, a package by Oracle. He, Adam was both at Oracle. So what we were able to do was use that as pretty much as the funding for our first year, which meant that we could do what we wanted rather than necessarily we had to win business to, to, yeah. to earn money. Um, so we actually turned, you know, I turned a, we turned a contract down at SAP um, because we didn't want to do it. Hmm. Um, and it would have distracted us from our main vision, which was we believe that the world has changed through social media. And that the the only way that organizations are going to going to compete in a digital world is to take social media and run it through the business strategically. Yeah. Um, and and so what we did was that um, back in 2017, what we so when we started the company, we had we had my book um, and we developed a program. And, and the first customer we got was Thomson Reuters which is pretty much where we took the, 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 the product and tested it out. By the time we got to 2017, we found that we're in a situation that every time we ran it, it was predictable. We knew the result that we were going to get, which is um, we can increase your revenue by 30% and reduce your um, sales cycle by 20%. And it's, um, it's, we knew that every, every time we ran it, it was exactly the same. So at that point, we executed basically the next set of in our vision, which is to go, right, we've got, we've got social selling. So how about if we've got social procurement or social HR or um, and, and basically go right across the organization? Yeah. So I should probably take a step back. So we had when we started off, we had a strategy session to build a strategy for an organization and social selling. And then what we did was that in 2019, we launched um, social human resources, social procurement, um, and then, of course, after we launched all those, COVID hit. Yeah. Um, so we went back to selling just social selling because I can say it's easy. For, if I come to you and say I can increase your revenue by thirty percent and reduce yeah. your, you know, you, you'll say okay. If I come to you, so so for example, we have a client um, in um, in Cambridge in the UK that's cut all of their expenditure on recruitment consultants and um and recruitment ads because they no need to no longer need to do that the reason for that is that this isn't just about the the, the modern buyer which we know is on social media but the modern job hunter is social on social yeah. media modern investor is on social media everybody is on social media so if we want to the place where we need to go to to get our um our future employees is on social media yeah. So if we're basically putting out content and saying, you know, this is the culture of organization, this is our ESG policy, this is the way that we have, we provide diversity and inclusion, this is the way that we have equity, what will happen is that people will be working away, going through LinkedIn and go, do you know, that's the place I want to work. Yeah. And then actually contacting you direct. And that completely, what this does is it completely changes the operating model of business because it strips out cost but but um, also makes the organization more efficient. Yeah. So so and by doing that, um, th th this changes business completely. 
Um, and we're the only company in the world that does this. Okay. Well, it's a good position to be in. It is. So so the yeah. McKinsey's and the KPMG's and all of that, they don't understand digital. No. Yeah. Well, that's, they don't, yeah. So they yeah. don't understand. They don't understand the way, even though they may write a load of articles about it, mm. you can look on their LinkedIn profiles and actually they don't understand it. So um, recently there was a, um, there was a study in 2021 by career arc that said that 96% of job hunters use social media. Yeah. Now, I don't know what the other 4% use, but 96% of job hunters. So they're coming onto your LinkedIn profile and they're looking at your senior team. And you know that you say that you're a diverse organization. I can see if you are. And so, mm. can, you know, this is how people under 30 think. Yeah. yeah? We, we can see, you know, when you put out a post about um, uh, International Women's Day, we can see how many people that you've got on your board that are women. Yeah. And, and what we're looking for are an organization that has the same belief systems that we do. Kind of going back to the, 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 the book about... Um, what a business should be doing in society. Um, and, but business just doesn't understand the way that the, the, the modern um, uh, job hunter is, is thinking. Um, and the other thing, so, so let's, let's stop a minute and think about sales. So we just recently did, a, um, we did a, an experiment. We took a small team of people who were cold calling we trained them in social selling to see what the response was. Yeah. So when they were cold calling, they got two meetings a week. Now, whenever you make a cold call, one of the things that you have to do is the, the objective of that cold call is to get a next action. So it's a meeting or a discovery or a demo or something like that. Of the two meetings of, of, of um, a week they could get, 0.3% of those went to a next action. Yeah. So what we did is we tra trained the team in social selling. They're not cold calling. All they're doing is social selling. They're now getting 11 meetings a week. Um, so they're getting a 9% return on cold outreach. Yeah. They're getting 11 meetings a week. Last week, they got 23. And from the next action, they're able to get, a, they've got a 33.6% response. Yeah. That's an exponential response. This, this, proves that cold calling is dead yeah well, cold calling should be dead but well it, it should be time. but this nails in this yeah. nails the last nail into the coffin because you know the thing is is up until this point we never had the data to actually um test yeah. it but this is this is this is a quarter's worth of data yeah. um and and that's one of the things that we've done is that you we've used our social selling program with this team and this is the response that they're getting. And this is this is groundbreaking. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there are people who do cold calling on social media. It's the people who are DMing on LinkedIn or so, Twitter. And yeah, so this, so this is not connect yeah. and pitch, which is basically yeah. spamming. And this is not using any form of automation because if you do, LinkedIn will basically block your account. Yeah. Um, this is purely working on Seth Godin's permission marketing yeah. um, principles of someone saying, Do you know, I think I've got something in common with you. Why don't we go on the call? Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, I wrote a book about social media yeah. networking and uh, it's, it's sort of complementary to what you were saying. But there was actually this really interesting statistic from the U.S. Bureau of Labor that I came across which I mentioned in the book. I can't remember when it was from, but they said that of all the jobs in the US, job advertising, only 60% had um, an interview process and the other 40% were given to somebody they already knew. Yeah. Of the 60%, half, even though it was an interview process, half of them went to a job the employer already knew. Yeah. So you can kind of see it's like social media is a way for somebody to know the employer already. That's the point I make in my book. But, I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, if you're looking for a job, yeah, then then you've got an ability to go onto social media and connect to the people, yeah. Have you know, and ultimately have a conversation with them. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the mistake that people make is that they come onto social media and they treat it like they've treated all sales, which is, is based on interruption. Because cold oh, yeah. calling, email marketing, and advertising is based on interruption. So 
we come on social media and interrupt people. I mean, nobody wants it. It's surprising. Yeah. It should well, be I mean, based on permission marketing team terms. Yeah. Well, at least, I mean, I mean, have you got a podcast or a live show or anything? I do. Have a, we, I have to, a podcast on a live show. Yeah. Show. Well, I mean, if you, I'm sure you get pitches that are totally inappropriate for the show, I guess. I mean, I've got an old podcast I had years ago that I haven't done an episode for, which was called Begin Self Publishing. And I get people who like, I get random emails from somebody who's clearly been hired on like five or something to like somebody, Bob is the world's best fly fisher. Can he come on your show and begin self publishing? It's like, you can just look at the title of the show. I like the show hasn't had an episode since 2019. So it's kind of clearly dead. And B, it's got begin self publishing. It's got nothing to do with fly fishing in it. And the number of inappropriately qualified um, pitches I get for shows. Yeah, the, the, yeah, I'm on a I'm on a um, a website for my podcast for both um, guests and and um, which is called Matchmaker.fm, which yeah. I use the free version. And the people who come through are fairly okay. I do get. Uh, unfortunately, the Americans insist on pitching where yeah. it's like, you, you, you know, I'm, I'm very, very clear about what the podcast is about. Um, and you coming on and telling people how great you are is not what it's about. Yeah. Because most podcasts, actually, to be honest. Yeah, because because actually, um, you know, my podcast is about um, my podcast is called Tim Talk and it's about being educational. Yeah you're going to come on and you're going to show people that you're an expert at what it is that you're, what you're good at. And, and by showing you're an expert, people will want to talk to you. You know, mm. I had a guy who come on, who is, he is, he's got a um, MBA and a PhD and whatever. And he spent 10 minutes talking about how great he was and we lost the yeah. audience. Yeah. And while the last 10 minutes was actually really interesting about supply chain, the audience had gone because it was like, you, you're there to demonstrate your expertise in the discussion. Yeah. I know. It's interesting. I think you're right, and you're clearly on a company that's at the vanguard of things are moving towards a much more sensible way of doing things. Um, I mean, I think cold calling was necessary in the past just because there wasn't the information available. You could Yeah, I mean, I started my, my career yeah. back in the 80s on cold calling. Um, in those days, it was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, because it was the, actually people wanted to talk to you because it was the only way you rang them up and said, you know, I sold <laughs> payroll systems. And it's like, so what are new payroll systems like? Well, it's like this. And it's like, oh, wow. What online gross to net? Wow, that must be, that must be, that would save us an awful lot of time. People wanted to talk to you. Yeah. But now you've got much more information about potential uh, mm. clients, I guess, online. Well, you can, that's what social selling is all about. Well, you know, in all of us, whenever we buy anything, what we do is that we we, we go online and we, we pick up our mobiles and we search. Yeah. Uh, and we use, we treat salespeople as saying, I don't believe a word you say, um, mm. I don't trust you, and you're going to try and sell me something I don't want. Yeah. Um, and so what we do is that we use social media for for salesperson avoidance. I mean, most of the Gartner research shows says that buyers don't like the buyer experience and they want to go to be fully online I actually i actually think that's because what they want to do is get rid of the this 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 constant sales noise yeah anyway before we finish i've got to ask you a question which i probably should have asked on the amazon show but i see that you've got a very old-fashioned um record player behind you I it do. also looks like there's a reel-to-reel machine at the back as well yes so um, presumably, this is not that you've just not upgraded yet, but you're uh, more interested in antique stuff. So this is my uh, this is my great grandfather's seventy eight plan. Yeah. So in 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 the day, he um, he's one of these people that he had to. If you think about the person that always had to have the the first iPhone and stuff. Yeah. So before that, he had an Edison tubes, um, and um, so um in this this box here 
uh, is a record cabinet which my grandfather made, um, which has 878s in it. Ooh. So um, this is, um, while, while we're here, um, for those that may, may or may not know, um, this is a 78 record. Oh, this, one, this is an Elvis one, but it's broken. So, Ooh. no, it's, it's Boyd Bennett and his Rockets. But it's, it's, it's actually um, smashed, that one. Yeah. Um, but let me find one that's... Um... Not smashed. <laughs> I mean that is the pro that is why that's why ultimately records because they are very um so that's a that's record. that's that's a yeah. 78 so so different from a um a 33 and a third or yeah. a single um, and it works cool? this 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 works is it you rpm or that. is it the size of the 78 i think so is it rpm rotations per minute the 78 yes so it's called a 78 because it rotates at 78 yeah. um and what you have to do is that it um I wonder if you can. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, well, we'll probably, so, I don't yeah, want you, to have to, you have to wind it up. It, it is quite um, yeah. uh, precious. And that my father was a um, a sound engineer at the BBC. Yeah. Um, and that was one. That's a semi-professional tape recorder. They sell for about twelve hundred oh. on um, on eBay. And that was one of his many tape recorders. Yeah. Okay. So we've covered all the important facts now, and this interview has gone on way longer than I thought it was going to go on. Uh, but it'd be it's great talking to you, and it's a thanks, great Tim. It's been great, great talking to you, and you know we've been um, uh, connected by a mutual friend. Yeah. Um, making. Yeah. So um, um, and so thanks to her. Yes. Well, making was a guest on this show. The, I think she said. She had eight books because she doesn't read that much. So it was a, more of a struggle for her. She was like, oh, I've got to read books now. I'm like, well, you don't have to read that many books. So uh, slightly on the other end of this extreme on the reading side. Yes. But, um, yes, certainly a great collection of books. And I think anybody interested in business could probably just read those 22 books. And uh, I think I, that's right kind of what I wanted to do in terms of picking them, yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Tim. And I'm going to end the broadcast now. I've got no. I've, every other show I've done, I've always had a little outro music, but I haven't done one for this show yet. So I'm just going to say goodbye to everybody. Yeah, Bye, everybody. <laughs>